So, good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse Hildebrand, and welcome to another exciting edition of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those who don't know, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants is all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Today, I'm excited to say we're joined by five classes from across North America. I'm going to go through one by one and give them a chance to give a big shout out. So first, we have Mrs. Gladys' class from Calgary, grade three class. Hi, guys. Hi. Awesome. We've got Mr. Zubas teddy bear in Calgary two, grade four class. They're, kit, they're not demuted right now, but they're excited just the same. We've got Mrs. Gibson's class from Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, hi. hi, guys. We've got Mr. Moore's class. I'm not sure if their mic's working, but they're from uh, Toronto, Ontario. And then we've got Mrs. Dorf's class that's just coming in from Taylorville, Illinois. So we've got some classes still pouring in. The reason you guys are all here, of course, is to hear George Caranis. He lives an incredibly exciting life. He gets to chase amazing natural phenomena and inclement weather all around the planet. He hosted Angry Planet. He's been lowered into volcanoes. He's chased hurricanes. He's done all sorts of amazing things. And today, he's going to tell us all about his recent trip to the Galapagos. So thanks so much for being with us here today, George, and go right ahead. Thank you so much, Jesse. How's everybody doing? Thumbs up? You guys can hear me okay? All right. Yes. Well, um, <laughs> as you guys heard, uh, my name is George, and I am a professional adventurer, explorer. Um, I travel the world, and I document the most extreme places all over the world. So what I want to do today is uh, show you just sort of like a little bit about what I do and some of uh, one of my most recent uh, trips to one of the most amazing places on Earth. So just let me get my screen share happening here. And I can, there we go. You guys can see that? Perfect, yep. Perfect. Okay, well, this is from the Galapagos Islands. And uh, there I am with one of the very rare land tortoises that they have on the Galapagos Islands, and I'm holding the flag of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. And basically, that's uh, that's an outfit that uh, is uh, dedicated to making Canada better known to the world and to Canadians as well, kind of like the National Geographic Society, but the Canadian version, because I am from Canada, as are many of you. So throughout my travels around the world, I've been extremely fortunate to go to about 60 different countries, all seven continents, places like Greenland and Siberia, Australia, New Zealand, Ethiopia, Madagascar, Antarctica, Alaska, you name it, all over the world. And most of the time, it's been uh, filming for my TV show, Angry Planet, sometimes with other TV programs, National Geographic and things like that, sometimes on scientific expeditions, but I started off as storm chasing, so I love extremes of weather. I spend a lot of time chasing tornadoes in uh, places like Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, where we can get some of the wildest weather in the world. And uh, that part of the United States gets about 75% of the world's tornadoes. So lots, between 800 to 1,200 per year. So I'm one of those crazy guys that you see on television driving straight towards the storm while everyone else is you know, evacuating, trying to get out of the way. And that includes hurricanes like Hurricane Katrina, Sandy, most recently um, Hurricane Matthew. I was down in Florida for that. But it's not just weather. I like to go after anything extreme involving the natural world. And that includes volcanoes, uh, not just uh, quiet dormant volcanoes but very active ones i like to go down inside and get very close to the lava yes yeah that's me down at the bottom left in my uh, protective heat suit there's a better view getting a selfie inside the volcano <laughs> that picture went viral all over the world a pretty crazy thing and that helps to protect me from from the heat so as you might imagine, I like to go to extreme places. But it's not just all of these uh, weather and volcanoes and stuff. Caves, uh, the Nica Crystal Cave in Mexico is another place that I love to explore, where you have these giant crystals made of uh, gypsum. And it's incredibly hot in there. It's about 52 Celsius. That's about 125 Fahrenheit. 
with almost 100% humidity. So the suit that I'm wearing is filled with ice. So the most recent trip that I've been on, though, is a little, little tame compared to some of the most extreme stuff that I've done. But interesting nonetheless. And actually, it's one of the most fascinating places in the world when it comes to wildlife. And I'm a huge wildlife fan. I love animals. I love seeing them around the world. Been diving with sharks, great whites, been swimming with piranhas and safaris in Africa, things like that. This recent trip was to the Galapagos Islands, which is technically part of Ecuador, and it sits right on the equator. There's the equator, which is the, the middle portion, of course, that one uh, spot around the middle part of the Earth where you go from a positive to a negative latitude. And we actually took a ship through the islands of Galapagos and crossed the equator several times. So if you were to look at your GPS, you would see your latitude as being 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right when you uh, cross the equator. As opposed to being at the North Pole, that would be 90 degrees north or the South Pole would be 90 degrees south. The equator puts you smack dab right in the middle. And one of the reasons why the Galapagos are so interesting is that they're actually volcanic islands. There's about a dozen or so islands, main islands anyway, of the Galapagos. And 97% of the islands is national park. There are a few people that live there. There's a couple of towns, but the vast majority of the uh, archipelago of islands here is uh, protected uh, federally by the country of Ecuador. And it's really interesting because as you go further west or left, as you see on the screen, the islands are younger and the ones on the right are the older islands, kind of like Hawaii, but in reverse. In Hawaii, the islands to the west are the old ones and the ones to the east are the new ones. And the force that creates that is quite interesting. There's a hot spot of uh, magma deep inside the mantle of the earth, this molten rock. And it's melting away at part of the crust. If you were to shrink the earth down to the size of an apple, the crust would be about as thick as the skin on that apple. So this crust that we float on, on, on the surface of planet Earth here, it's very, very delicate in the grand scheme of things. And when you have a lot of heat underneath, it can melt that crust, which releases gas. That gas bubbles up, brings the lava up with it, and creates new Volcanoes that start off under sea, a lot of them. In this particular case, Galapagos started off as undersea volcanoes. Then eventually got bigger as we move from left to right. We're getting uh, into now volcanoes that are breaching the surface. They've created new islands. The islands mature through more eruptions, lava coming out like crazy. But then eventually the crust moves very slowly through the plate tectonics, right? There are crusts on, our, on the surface of our Earth. These plates are very slowly moving. Uh, about the same speed that your fingernails grow. So it takes millions of years for these plates to move any appreciable distance. But as they do move, the part of the plate that's being heated by that, uh, that hot spot moves. And that's how we have a whole chain of islands that have been created where you've got the older ones on one side and the newer ones are the ones that are currently being affected by that uh, that hot spot which is pretty cool so as you uh, as you get to the um, younger islands like Fernandina and Isabella those are the islands where there are still active volcanoes today uh, I was the only one on the ship that was probably crossing their fingers and hoping that there would be a volcano erupting while we were there perhaps the wolf volcano or uh, Sierra Negra, those two have erupted in, in quite recent times, but unfortunately, we didn't have any eruptions while we were there, which is, I suppose, probably pretty good for safety reasons, but boy, I love seeing those things erupt. Um, as you go further east towards San Cristobal, Santa Cruz, those islands are older, uh, ancient volcanoes that have been eroded away by wind and rain and waves, and they are no longer capable of erupting. And, and one of the interesting things about the Galapagos is that the wildlife is different on every single island. There are slight variations in the wildlife as you move around from island to island. And that's why it makes it uh, such an interesting place for biologists to study. So when I went there just recently, a few weeks ago, we were on board this ship, the National Geographic Endeavor. So that was home for about uh, a week and a half or so. 
and we would go from one island to the next and go ashore and I was able to to get some amazing photos of some of the wildlife and I'm going to show you a few examples uh, I'm going to focus mainly on mainly on the reptiles of the Galapagos because I find them really fascinating and there we can see one of the islands. There's one, one of the newer islands, actually. Um, I believe that's Wolf Volcano, if I'm not mistaken. And you can see there's not a lot of trees, not a lot of plant life, because the islands are new and they haven't had the chance to establish the, the, the trees and the plant life there yet, because it's all just this new volcanic rock that's very difficult to grow things on. So there's not a lot on these uh, islands yet, at least the ones further west, the new ones. This is a shield volcano. Most volcanoes are very steep, sort of like a cone. This one kind of looks like, imagine if you took Captain America's shield and place it down on the, on the floor, on the ground. It would have this very low sloping hump, and that's what this type of volcano is. The, vol the lava that comes out of it is very fluid, so it doesn't form steep sides. It actually forms very low sloping sides. And there's an example of the lava that uh, has hardened. Of course, as it cools, the lava hardens into rock. This is Pahoehoe lava, very ropey lava. It has a Hawaiian name because, of course, there's a lot of volcanoes in Hawaii. There's also A'a lava, which is very blocky and sharp. And they call it, the, the story goes, they call it A'a lava because that's the sound that you make when you walk on it barefoot because it's so sharp and painful. But in amongst all the lava, we have the amazing marine iguanas. These are lizards that are found nowhere else on Earth. They are uh, quite frequent. There are different species of iguanas, about seven different species that are scattered on the different islands. Now, remember, each island has a slightly different species. And uh, that's one of the things that Charles Darwin discovered when he was there in 1835. He spent like five weeks in uh, the Galapagos studying the wildlife there, mainly the finches. But I love these iguanas. They're, they're almost invisible when they're lying on the lava rock because they're the exact same color. And it helps them to blend in and avoid predators. But they really stand out when they're on the seaweed. These things are uh, a couple of feet long. They look like little dinosaurs. And they're not really afraid of you. They uh, will let you walk right up to them. There are rules. You're supposed to stay six feet away or two meters or so away from these uh, from any wildlife in Galapagos. But if you stand still long enough, they'll walk up to you. Here's one of these guys looking kind of like Godzilla with the mouth open and the spit, <laughs> the little strings of spit in his mouth. They're vegetarians. They don't actually eat bugs or anything like that. They go into the ocean and they swim down. They can dive down to about 10 meters or 30 feet below the surface of the water. And they graze on things like uh, algae. And that's where they get their food. So technically, they're a marine species. They, they have to go into the, land, into the water to, to feed. But the water there is very cold. There's a current that comes up from Antarctica up the coast of South America. And the water there is quite cold. It's the Humboldt Current. And, of course, lizards are cold-blooded. So they have to regulate their body temperature by being out in the sun to warm up. And when they go in the water to feed, they get cold. They can swim underwater for about 10 or 15 minutes without having to breathe, but then they get cold. So they have to come up and then sun themselves on the, uh, on the rocks. And because they graze underwater, they end up ingesting a lot of salt into their system. And the way that they get rid of some of that excess salt is they blast it out their nose. They sneeze every, every couple of minutes. And it's funny sitting there watching a dozen of these lizards sitting on a rock trying to warm their body temperature back up. And every now and then they let out this snort and they blast this very salty water out their nose. It's, it's kind of gross, but I managed to catch one uh, doing it in, 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 a, in a photograph here just as he's sort of sneezing all over my camera lens. So that was kind of uh, entertaining. I, I love watching these guys. I could sit there all day. Uh, there's no other place in the world where they these guys are found. And I've got a little video clip here of one of them grazing underwater, and then he comes right at me. I believe it's right here. There we go. So there he is, underwater. You don't usually see lizards underwater. This is quite unusual. It's the only place in the world where this happens. This swimmer gets a little too close, and then away he swims, comes right up to me, 
and then moves on his merry way. So now he's going to go on shore and try and warm himself back up because uh, they're going to be they're going to be cold. Um, the only way to get to the Galapagos for wildlife is to is to basically swim or to be carried out on floating debris. There's there's no animal life that started on the Galapagos. All of it had to end up there at some point. So thousands, even millions of years ago, some lizards from uh, South America floated out there on some driftwood and they were able to uh, to procreate and create new species. Animals like the Galapagos sea lions, they're able to swim, so they uh, were able to uh, make their way out there from South America. And they are their own species, slightly different from the sea lions that you find in other parts of the world. And the little babies were there on the beach, extremely adorable. They sound like dogs, and they have no fear of humans. You can be on the beach, and they'll just walk right up to you. And uh, one of the ways that you can tell the difference between a seal and a sea lion is that sea lions have ears, these external ears that you can see. Seals will only have a little hole where they hear through. So that's one way of uh, being able to look at a photograph and learn, uh, be able to tell right away whether it's a seal or a sea lion. And these guys can get pretty big, uh, much bigger than me, and they'll pile up on the beach in groups and just enjoy the sunshine. Sometimes they'll even take over our stuff. <laughs> we went for a hike and left a bunch of our stuff under this tarp in a bag on the beach. And we came back from our hike and there were four sea lions that had decided that, uh, well, that, that our stuff was theirs now. And because it's a national park, these animals are protected and we're not allowed to go within six feet of them. So we had to wait and wait and wait until they decided to uh, eventually leave and go back into the sea. But uh, they, they'll just take over the place. They're hilarious to watch. It's kind of like being at a dog park. They're so funny. Look at the mouth on this guy. They'll come ashore and they'll go on the beach. And of course, when they come ashore, they're wet. So they end up getting completely covered in sand. Uh, I know that would bother me like crazy. I know when I go to the beach and I come ashore that uh, when I have sand all over me, I find it really annoying. But these guys, eh, they don't seem to care. There's all kinds of marine life around the Galapagos. We were um, snorkeling with uh, the sea lions, of course. There's a species of penguin that's there. These amazing red crabs that are found all over the islands. Um, the lizards, of course. Sea turtles. There are so many sea turtles there that at one point we were standing on, a, on our boat looking around and I was able to count about a dozen different sea turtles just swimming around the boat. They're everywhere. They're absolutely beautiful and uh, they're all protected in the Galapagos. And as you go further east in the islands to the older islands, the ones that have been around longer, there's more vegetation and you get different life there, including, of course, the giant Galapagos uh, land tortoises. These creatures are absolutely amazing. They can be huge. Some of the biggest ones can be, uh, I think the record is about 920 pounds. That's about uh, 415 or so kilograms. So just massive, massive animals. And they are distantly related to tortoises that were found on the mainland of South America. So at some point, million years ago or so, maybe a little bit more, some tortoises, maybe just, they believe maybe just one pregnant female or maybe a mating pair drifted out to the Galapagos Islands and they were able to reproduce and have uh, more tortoises. And there are slightly different tortoise species found on the different Galapagos Islands. There's, uh, oh, uh, something like, there used to be 15 species, there are 10 now because these were hunted, unfortunately, uh, for, their, uh, for their meat uh, back in the day. So, and they live a very long time. These tortoises can easily live over 100 years in the wild. The record in captivity is 170 years. So that is amazing for, uh, for an animal. They have a very slow metabolism, so they don't need to move a lot. They, they're very slow. They don't eat that much. But uh, they, uh, because of that, they can live a very, very long time. 
and they all look like these sort of <laughs> they all look old but it's hard to tell how old they are i'm not a, a tortoise expert but apparently you can you can judge their uh, gender and their age by the markings on their shell which i find quite interesting and of course they are reptiles as well so they have to regulate their body temperature externally on a hot day they will go and hide in the mud cover their skin with the mud to protect them from the sun and to help them cool down so that's one of the uh the ways that they can regulate their body temperature for us as mammals we humans are mammals of course we have to uh eat a lot because we generate a lot of internal body heat to keep our body temperature at uh, 98.6 or 37 celsius these guys, they don't do that. Their uh, body temperature is regulated by the conditions that they're in. That's why you don't find reptiles up in the Arctic or down in Antarctica. They simply uh, could not survive. Of course, Galapagos is known for its birds as well. It's a lot easier for birds to settle in the Galapagos than some of these other animals because they don't have to drift out on driftwood or swim. A lot of these uh, birds can fly. There are some species that are found only in the Galapagos. These boobies, for example, they come in different varieties. There's about four different types. There's the very famous blue-footed booby, which we know, of course, how it got its name with the beautiful blue feet. They build their nests on the ground. And there are also uh, red-footed boobies. And uh, they build their nests up in the, uh, in the bushes. And there's one with a brand new egg. So it's getting ready to uh, hatch some new chicks. And the blue-footeds and the red-footeds both seem to have the similar kind of face with that bluish beak and face. But of course, they got the red feet versus the blue feet. The uh, local people that live in the Galapagos, because the entire set of islands is a national park, the animals are all protected. So here's the local fish market, and it is hilarious. You can stand there and watch the pelicans, and there's a sea lion there in between the two people, and they're cutting up the fish, and they're selling fillets of fish to the local people, and every now and then they'll take the, the pieces that they cut off that they don't want, and they'll throw them behind them, and the sea lion will steal it, or the, the pelicans will steal them, and you end up with this, uh, this collection of wildlife that uh, know, they've learned over the years that every day the fish market is open, so that's pretty much a free meal. And they hang out, and anyone who visits the Galapagos loves to go here and photograph the, uh, the, the craziness that's going on at the fish market. It's one of those places that if you visit the Galapagos, you have to go and see this, because they're tripping over each other. The people are trying to sell their fish and they're tripping over the, the sea lions and the sea lions tripping over them and they're yelling at the sea lion to get out of their way and the sea lion is yelling at them to get out of their way. I'm not sure who's in charge here at the fish market. It was kind of hard to tell. And then further up the road is the, the uh, Charles Darwin uh, sort of research center and that is where they are doing all kinds of um, conservation work to protect the uh, the animals of the Galapagos, specifically the tortoises. And uh, a lot of them are in trouble. Uh, a third of the species of the tortoises um, have uh, gone extinct, and the numbers are nowhere near what they used to be. So luckily, the, the, uh, the numbers are rebounding. It's been uh, a difficult slog. There was one species of which there was only one remaining um, animal. The, uh, this one particular tortoise known as Lonesome George was uh, the last remaining individual of this one particular species of the Galapagos tortoise and he died a few years ago. So he was the last in line of that particular group. And I uh, just want to show you just sort of a little bit of a sign off here with the, just the beauty of the place. This is an old volcanic structure. They call it Kicker Rock because it kind of looks like a boot. And we were there at sunset just as the sun is setting and eclipsing sort of behind the rocks here. It is just a marvelous place. And so let me just uh, turn my regular monitor back on here. Bear with me. I should be able to do that. Camera's back on, right? You guys can see me? Yep. 
excellent 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 it's uh for years i've been wanting to visit the galapagos uh, when i was when i was younger i always wanted to be a marine biologist and then ended up growing up to become an explorer that specializes in all different types of extremes but wildlife has always been uh one of those things that i just love everyone seems to, everyone loves animals in one way or another and i love going to places where they are unique and the galapagos is certainly one of those places so uh, I would love to uh, hear what you guys have to say and maybe have some questions about uh, about traveling there or about any adventure at all. If you want to if you want to ask questions about chasing storms and stuff, I'll be more than happy to answer that, that stuff as well. Uh, there's uh, so much more I could touch on about the Galapagos. Uh, maybe it'll have to wait for another another uh, hangout. But uh, certainly uh, I would love to hear what you guys uh, what questions that you guys have. Awesome. Thank you so much, George. And we'll do a series of Galapagos Hangouts, and then you can tell us everything. We'll be perfect. <laughs> All right. Uh, so first, we'll go to Mrs. Gladys' class. You guys have a question? Uh, go right ahead. What volcanoes have you been in? What volcanoes have I been in? Well, I've been in, wow, uh, lots of them, actually. Um, I've been in, I just, this past year, I was inside uh, Pacaya Volcano in Guatemala, near a Gongo volcano in the Congo. Uh, the, I've been inside volcanoes in the South Pacific, in, um, in uh, geez, holy smokes, I have to look up at my map. I've got a big map above my desk. Uh, in Antarctica, in uh, basically about 20 or 25 different volcanoes around the world. Awesome. Yeah. All right, we'll go to Mr. Zuba's class. You might have to demute your own microphone uh, and worst case scenario, we'll go into another class and come back to you in a second. We might have to do that. Oh, you're good. How's that? That's good. Perfect. We got you. Uh, go ahead and ask the question. Yeah, go. Um, what is the neatest animal you've ever seen? There. Sorry, can you repeat that? The neatest animal you've ever seen, George. What's the neatest animal? The neatest animal I've ever seen, like the coolest or ah, geez, you know what? There's there's a few. Let me let me give you a couple of examples. Um, I was off the coast of Mexico one time, scuba diving in a cage, surrounded by great white sharks, and that is amazing. They are absolutely huge. Imagine some of them are almost as big as a bus with huge teeth and seeing those in the water really really amazing um i was in venezuela at one point and was able to catch an anaconda this anaconda snake was it's the biggest snake species in the world and it was so big it took five of us to carry it out of the jungle uh, and bring it out to an open spot where we could film it so those were really fascinating animals um being from canada i've been I've been up to Canadian North and uh, seen the polar bears up close on the ground. Really fascinating. I love the big predators. I find them fascinating. The apex predators of our planet. So the sharks and lions, bears, the snakes, uh, the Komodo dragons. That is extreme. I just love seeing those creatures. And of course, the Galapagos doesn't have these big uh, predators, but I find of the Galapagos wildlife, the um, the marine iguanas to be the most fascinating. Now, some of you may have seen a viral video that's been going around recently from the BBC. Uh, they produced a show called Planet Earth 2, and there's been a clip going around the internet recently about the baby marine iguanas hatching and being chased by snakes as they go from where they hatch down to the water. And uh, if you haven't seen it, it is absolutely amazing watching these little baby lizards trying to outrun dozens of snakes. And you really cheer for that lizard to, to, to survive. It's, a, it's incredible. You need to find it and take a look. It might be the best natural history video ever. So It might be one of the best pieces of television ever. It, Honestly, like uh, everyone should go check that out the moment it's done. I could even get it up and send it to the classes at the end of the day. So in the oh, meantime... We'll go to Mrs. Uh, Gibson's class. Introduce yourself, girl. Hi, my name is Atura. How do the penguins? How do the penguins in Galapagos look like? How, what do the penguins in Galapagos look like? They're tiny. They're these tiny little penguins. Uh, normally, in Antarctica, where most of the world's penguins live, 
um, they can they can be small. You've got um, several different species in Antarctica, but the biggest is the emperor penguin, and they can be several, quite a few feet tall, maybe four feet tall. But uh, the the Galapagos penguins are very very small, maybe about that big. We didn't see very many of them, but uh, we were snorkeling and had one swimming right past us. So they're uh, they're quite interesting. There's uh, they're very rare. It's the only place in the world where you can find the Galapagos penguin. Excellent. So we'll try Mr. Moore's class. I know there were some mic troubles earlier, but if you guys can talk, let's see if we can hear you. If not, how about you guys write your question, and then we'll get back to it in just a second, okay, guys? So try writing a question, and in the meantime, I'll go on to uh, Mrs. DeWerf's class. You guys will have to demute your own microphone. Sorry. There All right. Did that work? Are we okay? Okay. Perfect, yep. I got you. Okay. All right, go up there to the camera and you can ask him. <laughs> How expensive was the trips to like the volcanoes and going to the <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, as someone who travels as much as I do, yeah, travel does get very expensive. Um, if I'm going to do a big volcano expedition, it can cost sometimes tens of thousands of dollars because we have to do... Uh, sometimes there's helicopter flights involved and hiring a lots of locals to help, things like that. The trip to the Galapagos was um, provided to me by the Royal Canadian Geographical Society because I was on that trip as a representative of the Geographical Society. So that one didn't cost me anything. That was a, that was a free trip and uh, it was I'm very grateful for that. So over the years, every now and then, they'll sort of tap me on the shoulder and invite me to be a special guest on a trip somewhere so that's a, that's a real nice bonus so we'll go back to the question from mr moore's class uh, good question it's do you know how the iguanas process the salt into their noses how do they get it there do you have any idea yeah that's a really good question i'm not sure how that works because they're underwater and they're grazing away and i'm i'm guessing that as they chew at the algae they're they're swallowing seawater as uh, as you know sort of incidentally and their, their digestive system must have some way of processing that and sort of regurgitating it back up, kind of like how a bird can go and eat a bunch of fish, come back to the nest and regurgitate it back up to feed their, uh, their chicks. So the, the uh, lizards have some mechanism of bringing it up and then getting it into their nasal passage so they can blast it out through their nose. So it's a really interesting process that I would love to learn more about. Excellent. So about halfway through the hangout, we were joined by Mrs. Hudson's class from St. John's. Uh, I'm not able to demute your microphone either, unfortunately, but if you guys like to ask a question, go right ahead. Can we hear you guys? So... If we can't, if you can't get your radio working, same with Mr. Moore's class, uh, same idea. In the top left, there's a chat function, a little blue square. So just try that, write a question, and I'll pass it on to George, okay? So you guys try that. In the meantime, we'll go back to Mrs. Gladys' class for a second question. Yes, this was the first time to my to my first visit to the Galapagos Islands. It's a place that I've always wanted to visit since I was a little kid. I've known about it for for so many years, and it's been on my wish list of places where I've uh, wanted to visit. So when the opportunity came up to be able to go there and photograph the place, um, I, I jumped at the opportunity. So I can't wait to go back. I would. It's one of those places where I could go back again and again and again and and see different things every time i'm sure awesome uh all right we'll go to mrs gibson's class there you go introduce yourself hi i'm kenny which one which is your favorite volcano of all which is my favorite volcano of all well probably the um Marum volcano. Let me just uh, go back for the people that came in late. Let me just show the picture here. Um, hold on. Let me just give me one quick second. Here we go. Yes, this volcano here. You guys can see that, right? 
Yep. This is on um, Ambram Island in the South Pacific in the country of Vanuatu. And it's between Fiji and Australia. And it's a very active volcano. It's one of only five places in the world that has a lake of lava, which is exactly what it sounds like, a, a lake at the bottom of the crater. But instead of water, it's liquid rock that is boiling away violently all day long. And for us to go and get down to the bottom of this crater where the lava is, we had to fly to the South Pacific, take a helicopter to the summit of the volcano, camp there for about a week and a half, and then set up ropes 400 meters. That's about 1,200 feet from our campsite down to the very bottom. That's deeper than the Empire State Building is tall. So imagine rappelling on ropes down from the very top of the Empire State Building down to the bottom where there's a liquid rock uh, lake that's boiling away. So I've done several expeditions to this island. I've been down to the bottom about three times now uh, at this exact uh, spot. And it is fascinating. It's so violently boiling and just churning away. Imagine the sound of waves crashing, but instead of being water, it's lava. And the heat is so, so hot at the bottom that I actually melted one of my cameras. I had it sitting on a rock and I was hiding behind that rock as I was filming the lava and I grabbed the, the camera and the whole front, all the plastic at the front had all melted and was starting to droop. So I think of all the volcanoes I've been to, that one was probably my favorite. And I, I, I have a bit of a plan to maybe go back in a few months. We'll see what happens. Sounds like fun. <laughs> Depends uh, on your definition of fun. I, I for me, it is. I love watching these places where the earth is creating itself. And volcanoes are the only places where you can witness that firsthand. Actual islands being created and, and continents being formed. It's fascinating. Outstanding. So we got a question from Sophie in Mrs. Hudson's class. And that is, what was the scariest storm you ever chased? Oh, wow. The scariest. I'll give you two examples. How about that? The scariest tornado that I ever chased was one in Nebraska a couple of years ago. And we were driving down a dirt road and the tornado formed right beside us. And it basically went over top of us. And as it was doing that, it took one of those large, um, how do I describe it? Those uh, piece of farm equipment, these irrigation circles, it's kind of, uh, you know, these metal things on wheels that they use for irrigating the crops with water. And the tornado pushed one of those things over and the end of it went crashing through the windshield of the car I was driving. So imagine driving down the road, a tornado forms beside you, you have to turn into the wind so you don't flip the van. And then this big piece of farm equipment comes smashing into the windshield. So that was pretty scary. That video is on YouTube, by the way. You can go and find that. <laughs> Just do a search for farm equipment and storm chasers, and you'll find the video. Uh, the, the scariest hurricane that I ever encountered was Hurricane Katrina. And that was uh, the, the costliest natural disaster in US history. It was like being in a blender for eight hours as the hurricane crashed ashore. I was in a steel reinforced concrete parking garage, and that was the only building that I thought was going to be strong enough to survive that hurricane because it was so incredibly powerful. We saw a bank building that was completely destroyed. All that was left was the floor and the bank vault. The rest of the building was gone. Wow. Scary uh -huh. stuff. Scary stuff. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Dezuma's class. If you guys can demute your mic, that would be awesome. No, here, here. Okay. Like, um, so, if the Galapagos Islands are protected, then why is some animals going extinct? Okay, if the Galapagos Islands are protected, why why have animals been going extinct? The reason is humans, and the it's not so much that the the um, the islands are protected and the animals are going extinct. It's more that the animals were going extinct, and now the islands are protected. So back in the day, hundreds of years ago, when sailors would visit the Galapagos, 
they would take the animals and they would they would kill them. They would uh, they would take them for food. There are stories of ships that would take the sea tortoises, put the tortoises in the in the hold in the bottom of the ship, flip them on their back, and that's a way of preserving their food. They would stay alive. They don't have to eat uh, very often. The, the, uh, the, the tortoises can survive for weeks without food. So you could have turtle meat, fresh turtle meat, weeks or even months as you sail around the world just by stealing these tortoises and putting them at, you know, in, the, in, the hold, in the cargo area of your ship. So a lot of tortoises, unfortunately, uh, were killed and went extinct because of this type of practice. Now... That, the, uh, that damage has been done. So what Ecuador is trying to do is recover from that as best they can. Some of these species are extinct. We'll never get them back. But the ones that are still there are now protected by the national park, and it is illegal to harm them. Uh, so now, of course, they are protected. Uh, great question. We'll go to Mr. Moore's class. Uh, so I'm relating this to you. Uh, what's the biggest marine animal you've come across? The biggest marine animal I've come across was uh, I was in Antarctica kayaking amongst the icebergs. Beautiful place. Amazing. So gorgeous. There's glaciers and icebergs surrounding you. Light snow was falling. And I look over and there is a um, humpback whale swimming right beside my kayak and as i'm paddling i look down and it's looking right back at me and i'm paddling as fast as i can so that i can keep up and it dives and goes right underneath my kayak huge whale absolutely beautiful excellent uh we'll go to mrs hudson's class again so they passed along a question from megan and that is was there anyone who inspired you or encouraged you to become an adventurer absolutely when I was growing up, I had two main sort of uh, inspirations, if you will. Ocean explorer Jacques Cousteau, who was world famous for being a pioneer in terms of studying the Earth's oceans. And, uh, of course, his grandson is still exploring the world's oceans. But uh, he, he designed and built scuba equipment. He designed and built submarines and all these things. So he was my number one influence when I was growing up and Indiana Jones. So when you combine those two influences, you end up with a guy like me. I have to ask, have you ever been chased by any boulders? Uh, <laughs> a round boulder coming down. No, I've never. Uh, well, actually, well, there's been times when I've been climbing in volcanoes and my, and my uh, rope has dislodged some rocks that have come down on me. Does that count? That counts. That's okay, good. close enough then. Indiana Jones moment. <laughs> All right. Uh, last but not least, we'll go back to Mrs. DeWurst's class. If you could demute your own mic, that would be awesome. There you go. Got to class. What was the largest crystal you have ever seen? Oh, the crystals in the crystal cave. Yeah, that place is absolutely amazing. Um, I'll just quickly pull up a photo so I can have that in the uh, on the frame while I just talk about this very briefly. And uh, here we go. So some of the crystals in this crystal cave are 30 feet long, 10 meters, and some of them weigh 55 tons. So they're as big as tree trunks. And the reason that these crystals formed was uh, there's a chamber of magma about six kilometers below the cave, and the heat from that magma heats up the groundwater. And the cave at one point was filled with very hot mineral-rich water that was heated by this magma. And the conditions were just right for these huge crystals to form. And the cave was accidentally discovered about 15 years ago by silver miners. So these guys working in Mexico were, were 900 feet underground, mining away, and they broke through into this chamber that is about the size of a basketball court and had these massive crystals. It's very difficult to get permission to go here. It took me about two years to get permission to go there for just one single day. And uh, it's, it's limited because they only let, it's very dangerous because as soon as you start going in the cave, you start to die from the heat because it's so very hot and humid. Um, so there's only been a few filmmakers and a few researchers that have ever been allowed to go in that cave. 
Excellent. So those are some great questions, guys. Uh, what we do at the end of every Hangout is turn it over to all the classes. If you guys want to say a big thank you to George, I'll be demuting all your microphones. So there you go, guys. Thank you so much for being with us here today, guys. Great questions. George, that was awesome. And we hope to have you guys exploring by the seat of your pants again soon. Thanks, Thanks so, so much, much, guys. You're